Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming here to the 41st Darby Lecture Series. I think most of you know about the Darby Lecture Series. Uh, it started in 1978, and it's the 41st edition of Darby Lecture Series. So this whole event is a planned, managed, and executed by Chemistry Student Graduate Association. So I take a moment and thank all of the graduation who are here, who help us, support us, in organize this grand event. This event is one of the signature event and one of the prestigious lecture series of our department and also for this university. Each year we invite eminent scientists and Nobel laureates to be there and enlighten us with their knowledge. This year we are delighted to have Sir Fraser Stoddard as a Derby lecturer. So the man, I don't think he need any introduction. He's a Nobel laureate of chemistry in 2016, but I'd like to say a few words about him. He's originally from Scotland, and then he finished his uh, Bachelor of Science and PhD degree in University of Edinburgh. Now he's the professor uh, in Northwestern University at the Department of Chemistry. He has over a thousand uh, scientific articles he published during his last 45 years. Over a 400, uh, more than 400 PhD and postdoc students have been trained so far from his lab. So we are very delighted to have him as a 2019 Derby lecturer. So please join me in welcoming Sir Fraser Stoddard. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gosh. And I also want to thank um, Megan uh, Toda. Uh, she's not able to be here because she's fighting um, a virus. Um, so um, that's a little bit uh, of a disappointment, I think, for both her and for me. Uh, but um, let me just move on from there to say how uh, absolutely thrilled I am to have been invited to give uh, uh, first of two lectures in this series, which has been going for so many years and has uh, obviously uh, attracted the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, participation of uh, some pretty uh, awesome uh, scientists in the past. So I'm uh, a little bit humbled by the fact that I'm standing here in their shoes. Um, <coughs> so for my technical lecture today, what I want to do is um, to put it around radical chemistry. And I uh, have a play on um, radical here. Uh, what I want to try and get across is the way my mentorship has moved over 50 years effectively now, almost, from obviously fairly close engagement with my students uh, in a kind of directive way, which is the way you have to start out, to a situation where um, they are more or less doing their own thing. Consider the fact that uh, during March I had only three days in Evanston uh, on the campus of Northwestern. This month uh, I think it might be four. Uh, in May, it will probably, uh, sorry, in April, sorry, in, 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 what was I saying, in, in, in April it would be about three, uh, in, in this month it would probably be about four, and in June it will also be um, in that same sort of uh, league. So my, my group of maybe 30 mainly postdocs hardly ever see me. So they're very much doing their own thing. And um, this is an experiment where um, most of them are very bright, um, all of them are very bright lads and lassies um, who, um, you know, given um, a huge amount of freedom, uh, are showing that they can be enormously creative. So on that score, I'm going to be featuring quite a few of them. It's going to be a lecture of featuring people as much as the science. But the science will begin with uh, a compound called methylviologin um, that finds many, many uses in chemistry, uh, present in many of the uh, solar cells that uh, have been uh, uh <coughs> designed and, and produced over recent years. Uh, but I met it uh, as a <coughs> person who was on sabbatical to uh, Imperial Chemical Industries in the period of three years, 78 through 81. And they were marketing this compound paraquat along with a near relative called diquat at that time worldwide wide, as a wipeout weed killer. And you know, here is the story really that uh, this compound turns out to be the building block for uh, our molecular shuttles, um, 
switches uh, and machines. Um, and you could not have predicted this, of course, would happen. All right, so the first person I want to feature is a Lebanese uh, man, Ali Trabosi. He came and joined my group while I was still at UCLA in 19, sorry, 2007 um, and moved to me, uh, with me to uh, Northwestern in 2008. Uh, he came from the University of Strasbourg uh, after having got his first degree in the Lebanon. In Strasbourg, he trained as a physical chemist, and I want you to get that message because he carried out an act of synthesis which has been described by another <coughs> eminent postdoc from the past in my group as a um, intellectually disruptive experiment. Um, and that experiment, um, he was <laughs> well informed about the previous history of uh, methyl viologen, the fact that um, it uh, goes back to the 1930s, and in more recent times, uh, Professor Hunig, who's still uh, going strong about 99 years of age at Würzburg, um, <coughs> studied the redox behavior of this compound. Also, uh, Professor Kochi uh, at the University of Houston, uh, now sadly passed on. Um, again, in more recent times, in a supramolecular context, in one of these host molecules called Cucurbituro, Kimon Kim in Korea, and of course, uh, both um, <coughs> these uh, radical uh, cations that are trapped as a pair inside the cucurbitural and the extended structure that uh, Cauchy produced are examples of uh, supramolecular uh, species. And then finally, just to indicate, um, and this is another player in the field, Kosovo, um, that the, 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 the radical pairing that I'm talking about is not just limited to the uh, biology and radical cations. So here is the experiment that uh, <coughs> Ali Trabolsi very courageously uh, carried out. On the left is uh, uh, cyclophane. It's often referred to as our little blue box. CBPQT stands for uh, cyclobisparaquat, um, MV for my methylbiology, obviously. And so what he said, and he created an own, his own little uh, inert uh, if you like, pseudo glove box to do this, uh, feeding nitrogen into it. And with zinc dust, he showed that if he could uh, uh, <coughs> carry out a reduction, he, he would get this tris radical tricatine. And lo and behold, um, very many measurements that we carried out on it showed that it was highly stable. Um, <coughs> these are the um, stability constant and the fact that the um <coughs> change in enthalpy is. Uh, as it were, driving the formation of this complex against uh, a negative change in the entropy. Um, <coughs> now, uh, there joined him, a very good uh <coughs> graduate student from the Middle West, w Midwest. He came from uh, Indiana University, Albert Fahrenbach, and together they uh, crystallized this one-to-one uh, -one complex and showed, just as uh, um, Koshi had previously that uh, these one-to-one -one complexes, as it were, go and make an extended uh, uh <coughs> structure in the solid state. And uh, let me just tell you something about Albert. He was an awesome graduate student uh, who, um, after he had finished with me, with about 36 publications, I think, uh, in his uh, four or five years, uh, went to uh, Harvard and spent a period uh, with the Nobel laureate Jack Sozak, learning about the uh, the origin of life. Uh, from there, uh, he moved to Japan, to uh, Tokyo, to uh, the Earth Life Sciences Institute uh, there. And uh, this last September, I uh, was appointed uh, to a position in um, the University of New South Wales Chemistry Department, namely a lectureship, where um, he has the freedom and the backup uh, from uh, a lab that I've established there to work independently. And this is the point I'm going to get across. A lot of these people, uh, or all of them, have been working largely independently uh, on this case, the origin of life. Uh, the next person I want to mention is another incredible graduate student, Hao Li. Um, <coughs> he spent uh, his five years with me at Northwestern and then a couple down in Texas with Jonathan Sessler at uh, UT Austin uh, before returning to China, where um, he is now since 2015. Uh, track 
tenure track professor at Zhejiang University. Um, and what uh, Howe Lee did was to uh, say, okay, let's use this radical uh, discovery in templation to make, in the first instance, a rataxane. And so he took this, uh, if you like, extended methylviologin, showed it the blue box, um, and he didn't use zinc dust, he used uh, ruthenium bipi um, as a photosensitizer in the presence of a sacrificial electron donor and uh, light to uh, get the complex formed. And then having formed that one-to-one -one complex, he used um, uh, <coughs> non-copper related uh, click chemistry in order to put uh, stoppers onto this dumbbell and therefore create a rataxane. And provided that uh, rataxane exists in the uh, um <coughs> glove box, it is stable as you see it there. Um, <coughs> But um, if uh, you shorten, and I should say if you take it out, then it oxidizes and uh, you have a situation where the ring uh, moves away from the uh, charged by pyridinium system having itself gathered four positive charges. So at the bottom you see the example that I was just talking about, which I think has 11 methylenes, how progressively decrease the number of methylenes to end up with um, only um, <coughs> three, and you'll notice that uh, not only did the uh, barrier to what we call shuttling, that is jumping of this ring from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, a degenerate process, uh, going over what we would call an electrostatic speed bump, decrease, and I would associate that decrease with destabilization of the ground state. Uh, not only did that happen, the compounds got more and more stable as they were brought out into the uh, laboratory and put on the bench. So that the one with um, only free methylenes where the uh, rings are forced together, uh, or the ring is forced together with the uh, internal uh, uh, rod like uh, bipyridinium unit, uh, of course as the radical cation, uh, in all instances these bipyridinium units uh, it existed, the trisradical tricatine, for several days. And then, um, <coughs> in the wake of all this, and uh, this is very much uh, as visiting home ground here, uh, Jonathan Barnes uh, joined us. And um, Jonathan came from the University of Kentucky. Um <coughs> I trust that is listed somewhere. If not, that's an oversight. Um, and uh, he uh, immediately took uh, attention to uh, what Hao Li had uh, discovered and uh, said, uh, could I make a two catenane with these two blue boxes, which uh, when fully oxidized would have no less than eight positive charges. And that seemed to be, um, for many, many years, no one had even thought of doing this. And, uh, he was successful in that. That's his um, science paper in the middle uh, of this uh, stack of papers. Uh, again, he was very prolific, uh, and he's now um, at the University of, uh, well, sorry, Washington University in St. Louis, having postdoc in MIT with Jeremiah Johnson. And uh, he's a force to be reckoned with, and I'm pleased to say that he and his wife are joining us, uh, thanks to the students, uh, making it possible for uh, Jonathan and Melissa to be my guests uh, at the Derby on Saturday when we hope it doesn't rain. Um, right, so uh, what did Jonathan do? So he said, okay, let's just take the little blue box, let's take this uh, paraquat derivative, if you like, and uh, form a one-to-one -one complex. And he characterized this fully. We have a crystal structure. I'm not going to show that. Um, and then just simply added uh, <coughs> bipyridine to it um, with a catalyst uh, and, uh, and waited for three days at 80 degrees, changed the counter ion, and lo and behold, through the intermediacy of a tetraradical tetra cation, uh, and it brought out to the bench, it uh <coughs> came to rest as um, a septa cation monoradical. And so we had fortuitously discovered another example of a organic um, persistent radical. 
So um, to push it through to the octocation, uh, one has to use a strong oxidant, uh, this imine that you see there, this radical uh, cation, um, often called magic blue, and that allows you to uh, oxidize it through. And remember, it's not obviously as the uh, monoradical septocation going to be possible to run an NMR. As soon as we got it through to the octocation, we get this very beautiful uh, NMR spectrum, which shows, unlike many of the other uh, catenines that we made previously, that the two rings are absolutely locked together because uh, these um, rings are um, cyclophane-like and there's not any sort of room for them to uh, be in uh, fast motion, at least on the NMR timescale. Um, he also characterized uh, the um, uh, new uh, <coughs> homocatenine uh, by uh, spectroscopic means um, and uh, was able to show also by uh, X-ray crystallography that uh, the octocation is, uh, as you see in this orange uh, display. Uh, and what is more, um, was able to show that uh, when compared with the crystal structure of the septocation, the sexocation and the tetracation, uh, uh, a means of identifying where the radicals live uh, came from the torsional angle between the um, pyridinium rings, if you like. So if they're fully charged, dicationic, the value hovers around about 20, 25. If uh, they are um, in any way associated with a radical, they're close to zero. So you'll see that the um, monoradical septocation, the two in the middle are uh, down at um, almost zero, 1.5 and 0.7. And so that's an uh, uh, indication that the radical is shared between these two inner bipyridinium units. And so to summarize um, <coughs> the work done by Jonathan, uh, he was able to identify um, four of the um, uh, <coughs> compounds by uh, spectroscopic and uh, also by um, crystallographic means and uh, subsequently using uh, cyclic voltammetry, electrochemistry to see another two. So we were able to identify six out of a total of uh, nine possible uh, structures. Okay, so uh, let me move now to Marco Frasconi, an Italian postdoc, again, uh, a brilliant young man who uh, spent about three years with us. He's now at the University of Padova, uh, and uh, he probably topped uh, for about 40 or 50 publications in high-profile places during three years. Just simply, through not my coercion on his own will, um, spent um, long hours in the laboratory. The tragedy here is, and returning to Italy, to Padova, after three years he does not have any uh, support uh, in the way of graduate students or any money. And this breaks my heart. And um, unfortunately this is um, very true in Italy and also in some other European countries, that young people are not supported the way they should be. So I'm on a bit of a mission to uh, try to do something about this. So while he was with us, um, he, uh, <coughs> and this is just, you know, 1% of the many things he did, just a simple thing. He said, well, let's just take the um, cyclophane, let's reduce it to the bisradical dication and characterize that, and also all the way through to the neutral species. And uh, we were interested in the neutral species and how that would behave. Um, and uh, he was able to do this reduction in a controlled way, either with zinc dust or even better by using um, two equivalents of cobaltocene to get it to the radical cation um, variety in the middle there, the purple one, and then another two equivalents to take it through to the neutral species. And so, as you might expect, um, we have uh, <coughs> in the red box, uh, as we called it, a complete loss of um, aromaticity and uh, it taking on a polyene-like uh, structure. Um, <coughs> so this is the take-home message. Uh, from uh, this little piece of work that uh, Marco did, you get dramatic changes in not only the uh, structure of uh, this uh, box from being blue to purple to being red, but um, it also uh, changes its um, binding properties from liking pi-electron um, <coughs> rich systems when it's fully charged to 
uh, liking uh, pi electron deficient systems, not uh, in a big way, but uh, certainly enough to get one-to-one -one complexes when it's read. Um, the next person I want to mention is a Chinese boy, Yu Ping Wang. He's presently um, <coughs> at uh, MIT on his postdoc. Again, he was very prolific, um, and uh, he came up with um, a very uh, nice way of making uh, both, um, uh, well, a couple of two catenanes here. Uh, his, his contribution was um, to take, uh, instead of zinc dust, to carry out the reduction of the um, <coughs> bipyridinium, use, he used um, copper dust. And that copper dust, of course, gets oxidized to copper one. And uh, therefore, in situ, he used that uh, presence of the copper one to carry out uh, carplus style uh, click reactions uh, to form uh, these uh, uh, <coughs> triazole ring systems that uh, allowed him to uh, produce a catenane in uh, 70 to 60 percent yield. Um, <coughs> Postdoc who's with me at the moment, uh, Kang Kai, um, he um, has uh, uh, made a name for himself with the Nature Communications where uh, we effectively have a Russian doll type structure. Uh, he made a rather larger cyclophane so that um, in its radical cationic form it would complex as the um, reduced species with um, the um, blue box being reduced to its uh, radical cation and in the middle showed that you could complex uh, many uh, uh, <coughs> aromatic ring systems as shown there where R can take on very different functionalities. Um, <coughs> Dr. Mark Lipter, who came from uh, Berkeley, uh, is now, um, well we'll come to that in a minute probably, let me just take the chemistry first of all. Uh, he took um, a bigger um, cyclophane where we pre-placed uh, and had done this uh, historically 20 years ago, the bridging phenylene units with uh, bitolal units uh, to uh, allow two pi electron rich systems to live inside. So historically we had shown that you could put tetrathiofulvaline and also um, uh, ferrocene inside this uh, cavity. And so he asked himself, uh, would it be possible in the radical uh, chemistry to uh, put uh, inside a methyl biologin based uh, cyclophane. He tried the uh, uh <coughs> one that we've been looking at all the rest of the time here, the so-called little blue box. Um, it's just too big and so he replaced the para substituents on the uh, phenylene group with uh, meta uh, connections and that slips inside uh, very nicely into this larger one so that you've got a ring and ring type of uh, structure here. So uh, this rather unusual motif, he went on and here he is. Um, Mark has now uh, been with Rutgers uh, as an assistant professor uh, for the last, uh, I guess, couple of years. How time flies. Uh, <coughs> And he went on to show that uh, he could build a rotaxane based on this motif, uh, where uh, you have the same building blocks that you saw in his one-to-one uh, -one complex. And in this uh, rotaxane, if he is in the uh, situation where it's reduced, the ring sits on the middle and uh, is uh, forming this one-to-one, uh, -one, as it were, interaction with the smaller ring. However, when it's oxidized, um, is forced to either the left or the right. And we have another example of what we might call a molecular shuttle, uh, where the big ring has to pass over the small ring, uh, which is not so much a steric barrier, but an electrostatic barrier. And uh, <coughs> now, uh, thank goodness, we have a young lady from France uh, who came from Bordeaux University, and she continued on with uh, Mark's work after he left, and she, he is still with us. Um, and what she has designed is what we call an artificial molecular zipper. And so you see the structure uh, of this uh, molecular zipper is based on Mark's uh, um, <coughs> interaction between that large cyclophane and the small one when they're in the uh <coughs> reduced uh, radical cationic state, all the bipyridinium units. 
And what she could show very nicely from uh, particularly uh, very, very nice NMR spectra is that uh, if she takes this reduced state with these two um, arms that you see on the right-hand side with uh, naphthalene units and uh, oxidizes it, then uh, you will get the advent of Coulombic repulsion to send the um, ring away from uh, the massively now charged, that would be eight positive charges in that uh, unit on the left-hand side if it was drawn, uh, to uh, a donor acceptor type of interaction where the two naphthalene rings are sitting inside the uh, positively charged tetracationic cyclophane. Uh, <coughs> now, a Vietnamese boy, Min, um, he again is a prolific uh, postdoc. Um, he came from Texas, he got his PhD at UT Austin, and he's been with me for two, three years now, I would say. Um, and here's something that he did. So uh, he built on the work of uh, Jonathan Barnes, where you can see the uh, arrow here um, showing you the science article that uh, announced the homocatenine um, and took that a step further by uh, making bigger ring systems so that he could make a free catenane and uh, a five one or what is sometimes called a necklace on the right hand side where the charge rises to uh, 12 and then up to 24. And uh, his uh, studies graced the front cover of uh, CHEM last October. And what's interesting about uh, these compounds is that uh, they have, uh, for their very small volume, um, large charges. And so for the positive charges in a sort of square, sorry, re repeat that, cubic nanometer, uh, you go from uh, Jonathan's octocation at 6.4 charges up to, in this middle, free catenane to 7.3 and then dip back down to 6 because you get quite a bit of room in this 5 catenane. All right, so <coughs> that's just to let you see the kind of uh, creativity that uh, young people come up with if you give them their heads. And I've no other option. The last two years, I've spent very little time at Northwestern, and so I have to say to them as they come in, and they are warned that they will be having to come up with their own ideas, and uh, then uh, <coughs> I will help when it comes to, of course, the publication stage. And even that, of course, is challenging. Um, <coughs> so uh, my message really is you give young people a lot of space, and uh, it's just amazing what they come up with. And I won't be talking about it today, but uh, two other young people in that same era of this decade have uh, come up with discoveries that have led to two startup companies. So um, what I'm going to do now is just define some icons um, <coughs> and give you the sort of history of maybe what you came to hear about, molecular machinery. Um <coughs> and it all started with uh, donor acceptor interactions before the radicals came on the scene back in uh, the late uh, 80s. Um, <coughs> and so when you see a red and a blue, uh, they're uh, involved in complexation because of donor acceptor interactions aided and abetted by hydrogen bonding. And molecular recognition will be shown to be on when using the Fisher um, motif of a key and a lock, or a lock and a key, uh, the key is in the lock and off when the key is out of the lock. Uh, templation, I'll indicate uh, as we go through this uh, sequence of movies uh, with the sort of template that uh, certainly older people in the audience will be familiar with just for drawing three, four, five, six, seven membered rings. Um, the radical templation, of course, I don't need to talk about. We've just been going through that in great detail. Um, sometimes we will use heat in order to make something happen. Uh, sometimes we'll use some electricity. Uh, sometimes uh, ratios will be not one to one, but some other ratio, which means that we've gone from what we call a shuttle to a switch, and then sometimes we'll be able to uh, <coughs> convert probably the uh, non-degenerate one, as you'll see, from being a non-degenerate shuttle into a switch. And so I'm going to have a brief um, rest here, and uh, hopefully with a little bit of music in the background, uh, I can take you through 35 years of uh, development 
of the chemistry that led to our, um, <coughs> well, one of our molecular machines, the, the most recent one, the so-called molecular pump. That gives you at least a feeling for um, the, um, let's say, the chemistry that uh, led to 
our contribution, first of all, to the mechanical bond and its use in uh, shuttles, switches, and machines. Um, but again, I have to emphasize uh, by featuring people that uh, fellow Scott Paul McGonagall, he actually was brought up about four miles away from where I was brought up at a different time in history, of course. Um, having taken his PhD at Edinburgh with my ex-student David Lee, um, came and spent uh, two or three years with us at uh, Northwestern, great intellectual force as well as a good practical chemist now, the equivalent of an assistant professor at the University of Durham in the UK. Uh, Chu Yang Chen, quite an incredible graduate student uh, who came from Peking University and is really Mr. Uh, molecular Pump in many ways, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that work in a minute. Uh, he's now an uh, assistant professor at Sushan University in China. And so let's just look at this uh, movie of the molecular pump again, and uh, I'll define it in terms of uh, chemical constitution in a minute. But you can see, and we'll let one of these rings go on to the collecting chain on the right-hand side. Um, when uh, you reduce the system, it wants to come back. The second one comes on, and um, at the speed bump, which is the green part, um, we need heat to force it over onto the collecting part of the thing. So here is the chemical constitution of Mark I molecular pump. Um, you can see it uses the so-called little blue box. Um, it also uh, has, reading from left to right, uh, by uh, sorry, a pyridinium room with a pyridinium ring with um, substituents at the three and five positions. Um, then there's a bridging bismethylene into a bipyridinium unit, then another bismethylene that joins it to the green speed bump. This is a phenylene unit with an isopropyl group on it. And all of these are having to be uh, finely tuned and carved. I mean, I think we looked at uh, 30 or 40 different uh, uh, green units, so-called speed bumps, till we got the one that worked best. Um, <coughs> and then from there, through a triazole, so obviously click chemistry was used in the final resort to add this um, long polymethylene chain with a genuine stopper at the end, a benzene ring with two isopropyl groups. And so you see the uh, <coughs> pro-NMR spectra of this um, uh, pump, uh, and then uh, at the next uh, step you see the result of uh, using the ring uh, along with um, the dumbbell in the presence of zinc dust to do a reduction. Um, and then with nitrosyl hexafluorophosphate carrying out an oxidation. And the next spectrum you see is that oxidation has occurred and the ring is sitting on the speed bump uh, waiting to get over. And uh, with an eye of faith you can see some high field signals appearing, but if you wait another hour and a half and notice this experiment's being done at 42 degrees centigrade, um, the ring eventually makes its way over um, in its total uh, amount uh, onto the collecting chain. And we can repeat this process, as you saw in the movie, and bring a second one on. Um, and of course, the signals for the high field um, methylene protons change quite considerably their chemical shifts when there are two rather than one ring. So um, to summarize here, um, again looking at this movie, we're doing chemistry away from equilibrium. Um, what we are uh, achieving is to bring one and then two rings on. The first ring, through this process of using zinc dust and uh, nitrosyl hexafluorophosphate, um, occurs with uh, a 90% yield to give an isolated uh, two catenane that you, sorry, two rotaxane that you see at the bottom. The barrier that we can measure uh, for the um, surmounting of the um, uh, <coughs> green speed bump by the uh, re uh, oxidized um, fully charged uh, uh, blue uh, box is, is 23 kilocalories per mole. And if you repeat this for the second one, the yield's a little bit less uh, in terms of uh, the yield of uh, the process. It's at 85% um, and the isolated yield of the free uh, retaxing below is 77%. Is, um, uh, but the most important number on this slide is the second barrier, which is, to all intents and purposes, within experimental error, the same as the first one, which is telling us that uh, the presence of that first ring on this collecting chain 
is in no way making it more difficult for the second one to join it. All right, so <coughs> the great thing about um, this uh, work is that we've now made a machine because uh, we've not allowed that ring to go back into solution and we've uh, allowed a second ring to come on and as we bring on more and more rings we're going to be increasing the energy of this system and you can relate that through to having, if you like, having done some work. Then there came on the scene uh, this brilliant young Italian boy. He uh, obtained uh, from uh, the um, Italian uh, <coughs> uh, system the 2015 Primo Levi Prize. So this is awarded by the Italian Chemical Society the, to the top PhD student in the whole of Italy. And so when Christian came, he said, um, I want to increase the efficiency, the uh, speed with which uh, the pump uh, operates, and so I'm going to show you his Mark II. He subtly changed, uh, for reasons I can't go into, the sighting of the methyl groups and the pyridinium group at the um, left-hand side from 3.5 to 2.6. And the most important thing I think he did was to take out one of the methylenes between the bipyridinium unit and the speed bump, which means that when the um, <coughs> fully oxidized system comes into being, there's much more columbic repulsion uh, between the bipyridinium unit in the pump and the ring the two bipyridinium units in the ring. And so you'll notice that now we have the same pattern of events that we had before, but now we're doing this work at room temperature. And if we extrapolate up to uh, uh, <coughs> 40, 42 degrees, we're able to do this pumping in minutes rather than hours. From here, um, we've moved on and uh, we're putting pumps at the end of uh, common or garden polymer chains, things like polyethylene glycol or polystyrene. And uh, we're also, thanks to Christian, who designed this uh, electrochemical cell, replacing the um, reductant and the oxidant, the zinc dust or whatever we use, and uh, nitrous oil, hexafluorophosphate, because using those over and over again, we're going to be accumulating waste. If we do it electrochemically, it's going to be very, very much uh, uh, nicer. And so he designed this dual pump in which he has a middle portion with 36 in total methylene groups uh, symmetrically housing a couple of uh, dimethyl ammonium positively charged centers. So if rings go on there that are positively charged, you're really going to be raising the energy. And you see the <coughs> NMR spectrum at the bottom of uh, his dual pump, as always from Christian, a very nice spectrum. And then what he did was to use uh, his uh, home-built cell with the features that are down there in the bottom right-hand corner. And during a 10-minute period um, at minus 700 millivolts, if you like, brings the ring onto the pump portion. And then after a little bit of waiting, uh, switches over to an oxidative 1.4 plus volts to push the ring with uh, obviously the aid of uh, heat over the uh, uh <coughs> speed bump and uh, this gives him uh, this uh, um, three rotaxane with two rings having come on from both ends and he repeats this process and uh, brings on another two rings and well we stop there uh, to give us this uh, five rotaxane okay so uh, <coughs> these are uh, well characterized uh, by NMR, and uh, that is just a summary of what you've seen already. Uh, I won't belabor it. Um, <coughs> so, in a general way, uh, I think, uh, I hope I've convinced you that radicals have opened many doors. But before I go through the scientific ones, I think the main doors that they have opened are opportunities for these young men and women to do their own thing, and in so doing, demonstrate to the world at large just how creative they can be largely as postdoctoral fellows, even before they hit uh, the uh, ground running, hopefully as assistant professors. So uh, radical cations are good for establishing strong and direct channel homophilic recognition uh, used by Hao Lee and Jonathan uh, Barnes to make rotaxanes and catenanes respectively. Um, they produce, produce strong supramolecular complexes. Um, we've seen that uh, 
They can uh, be used to template, as I've already said, cathinines and rataxanes in what we call MIMS or mechanically interlocked molecules. Uh, we can obtain, uh, as Jonathan Barnes did, an air-stable persistent organic radical. That was his septocartine uh, monoradical. Um, <coughs> it provides access, as Min showed us, to our uh, N-catenanes up to five with multiple positive charges, packing a lot of po positive charge into a small volume. And who knows what these might be useful for. Uh, making MIMS with uh, large Coulombic repulsions. Again, that's uh, MIMS work. Um, and then introducing, I haven't uh, gone into this, uh, but if you have a long polymer with viologins in it, then you can make it uh, expand and contract just almost like a muscle uh, by doing redox chemistry. Um, <coughs> and also, um, last but by no means least in what we've achieved so far, uh, making uh, quite efficient molecular pumps for pumping rings onto polymer chains. Uh, finally, here is the dream that uh, out of all this, we might be able to forge a one-step synthesis uh, using electrocrystallization is the idea I'm trying to force, uh, uh, well, force would be the wrong word to uh, oblige, to uh, persuade uh, some of these uh, brilliant young people to uh, make a polycatenine, which is considered to be a holy grail. Um, it has, uh, by some other people, been made by more roundabout routes, but just one step uh, I think uh, is within our grasp using this radical chemistry. And so here's the radical school, as I often refer to it, founded by Ali Trabolsi. And isn't it quite remarkable that uh, all of these people um, have uh, emerged? Um, I haven't talked about the work of Belgian Damien Sussman. He's a single molecule man who uh, spent a year with us and is continuing to collaborate with us from the University of Liège. But I've talked about the in contributions of all the others, I believe. Um, quite remarkable. Um, okay, so a little bit of time for philosophy, is that all right? Um, so when, and this may come up in questions, but I didn't uh, uh, talk about it now. Uh, and, and these are just uh, sort of random thoughts about uh, uh, answering a question, which is, you know, how can you be successful um, in academia? And this is what I think, uh, and a lot of this reflects my past, which I've not gone into, but it was not an easy beginning. It was almost as difficult as Marco Frasconi's denied support as a young person in a European system. It's not a pleasant beginning. Anyway, to be successful, you need to put teaching students before research. Think about it. To let students take ownership of the research, and I hope I've shown you what happens if you do that. To put your students before yourself. Uh, to support your students through thick and thin. Yes, they will have times when they're visited by failure. Um, you have to give them a lot of um, support and a helping hand at that time. To identify a line of research that is receiving little attention. Um, to recognize the, that progress in research will be slow. Um, <coughs> very often it takes two or three years, uh, just in the five-year lifetime of a graduate student in this country, to start to get things moving. To be able to appreciate the significance of a discovery, this is very important. Uh, we have all got to use our eyes, and it really is the things that we're not expecting that often are the uh, <coughs> transformative uh, uh, events that happen in science. To find out how to manage research, um, that's important uh, if you're a PI, and to employ the best practice in writing grants and scientific papers, and to set very high standards in presentations, both oral and written. And uh, this has been picked up by the Nobel Foundation. Uh, I have a free liner, uh, which means that uh, in the first one, the strength of a horse, you need to uh, be visited as much as you possibly can by good health. And one of the ways there, not of course uh, foolproof, is to eat well. Uh, you need, if you're doing things that are um, a bit crazy and outlandish to uh, be ready to take lots of uh, criticism and stones that are being thrown at you. So having a thick skin, the height of an elephant, uh, I'm sure our Indian uh, colleagues will uh, be able to relate to that, uh, is important. And then if you get uh, onto uh, a discovery, as we did when we made our first catenane on the molecular shuttle, you don't just rest with two publications. 
you use the next decade to put out 200 publications and you leave the world in absolutely no doubt that uh, you have done something significant. If you had left it, or we had left it with these two publications, the naysayers would have won out because uh, there were people that were uh, you know, very dismissive. And the only way that uh, <coughs> we managed to <coughs> change that dynamic was to say, well, if you don't believe that a turotaxane can be made, and there were some uh, crazy uh, uh, comments about uh, even the making of our first two catenane, then we'll make a five catenane. And we did, and we called it Olympiadine, and went it up to seven. Uh, and these are fully characterized crystal structures. And that uh, quietens uh, people uh, that want to uh, uh, throw stones. Uh, to be successful in life at whatever, so now I'm going to dangerous land, uh, treat people how you would expect to be treated yourself. Be respectful towards people younger than yourself. This is very important. I did not have that experience when I started out um, in a hierarchical system, so that's where that comes from. Treat people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds exactly the same. Um, in Scottish lingo, we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns. Think before opening your mouth. Uh, very important. Uh, realize that we live in a village. Every day I come across situations where uh, as I travel the world you can link up people that have met in different places at different times. It's just quite amazing. Don't speak ill of other people. It'll come back to haunt you if you do. Be more ready to give than to receive. Be supportive to those around you and be ready, willing and able to hand out praise like no tomorrow and work out somehow how to turn really bad things, pig's breakfast, into a sow's purse, good things. The secret of success, according to Empresario No Card, is the capacity to survive failure. Now, <coughs> managing success is not too difficult. Uh, it's uh, the managing of failure that uh, really is uh, quite um <coughs> challenging sometimes. And. Uh, at a more light-hearted level, according to Warren Buffett, how to be cool, uh, saying thank you, apologizing when wrong, show up on time, be nice to strangers, listen without interrupting, admit when you're wrong, follow your dreams, be a mentor, a good one, learn and remember people's names, and hold doors open for people. Um, <coughs> moving on to uh, the whole dynamic of doing research. So this is for, I guess, everybody, including the PIs that will be sitting here. Um, I'm a great believer, and I think we've gone in the wrong direction over my lifetime from uh, what I would call academic freedom to almost academic shackles. Uh, the National Science Foundation in the US was uh, founded on these words of Vannevar Bush. Um, back in 1945, he was the scientific director to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Scientific progress on a broad front results from the free play of free intellects working on subjects of their own choice in the manner dictated by their curiosity and exploration of the unknown. And I hope my story today has done something to show that if you put these words to the experimental test, then there is no doubt that you will get a great return in terms of creativity and uh, of course, to get there, you get the engagement of people in their research. There's nothing like giving people ownership of the research to uh, produce really remarkable outcomes. <coughs> Helmut Schwarz, uh, retiring um, president of the Humboldt Foundation in Germany, uh, has much the same story. Fundamental research gives young people the opportunity to head for new shores. In order to master the future together, the enthusiasm of young people is the most secure currency we have. He goes on, the principle of training people, 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 rather than trusting a monitoring system based on distrust has proved its worth. The principle of funding people, 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 rather than projects has withstood the test of time. Very interesting article headed on the usefulness of useless knowledge. And it's not just in our arena as scientists, but if there are people in the audience from the humanities. Here's an example from a novelist, uh, uh, New Zealander Eleanor Caton, who won the Man Booker Prize for her 
novel, The Luminaries, in 2014. And when she went back to the University of Wellington to uh, be given an honorary degree in her acceptance speech, here's what she had to say. The purpose of a university is not to replicate, but to enlarge, not to simplify, but to understand, not to reflect or serve the world in which we live. That's a fairly, fairly provocative statement, but to enrich it through the creation and exploration of an infinity of possible other worlds. Okay, so <coughs> I have been, I have to say, with uh, as much creativity having to be put into finding where to get money to do research as doing the research itself, blessed with a good flow of funds over the years, uh, but even better than that and much more significant, a good flow of really um, incredible human resource. And that's just the drop in the bucket on the right hand side. Um, what pays off in a big, big way is diversity. And so uh, let me just emphasize science is global and science knows no boundaries. And in the context of my own research group over a 50 year period, we've been associated with six universities, two in England, two here in the US, one in China and one in Australia now. Um, <coughs> I think I um, <coughs> mentioned, uh, or maybe I forgot, I've forgotten, uh, that uh, all the work on Paraquat uh, began when I was uh, on a three year sabbatical at the ICI corporate laboratory in the UK. We have two startup companies, I didn't get there today, but again, they have been brought about by two postdocs doing their own thing and making, as it were, two transformative discoveries. Four countries we've been involved in so far, and uh, during the 50 years, there have been 50 different, 50 different nationalities as part of my um, group of somewhere in the region of 500 graduate students and postdocs. And so that's my story, and uh, I do thank you for uh, inviting me to come and uh, follow the footsteps of many of the great and good. Um, I'm reminded that uh, one of my uh, very close mentors, who was uh, Don Cram, he was the Nobel Laureate, uh, along with Jean-Marie Lane and Charles Paterson in um, <coughs> 1987, uh, he said uh, that for half the time in academia, you spend your time uh, trying to catch the coattails of the great and good, and then the other half of your time um, <coughs> trying to stop the young whippersnappers snapping away at your heels. Well, I think I've gone through the first of these, but uh, I don't have the experience of whippersnappers snapping at my heels because uh, I give them enough uh, room to uh, do what they want, and uh, they um, uh, just amaze me. That's all I've got to say. And uh, that's been basically the story I wanted to bring to you today. And finish by uh, thanking you for this invitation to give these lectures. And I'm very happy if there's time to uh, do my best to answer questions. Thank you. Um, and if I had a movie of it, uh, as the reduction takes place, um, you see this vivid purple color appear, which shows the formation of uh, the radical cations interacting with each other. And then when you go to the oxidative phase, you wipe that uh, very vibrant um, purple color out. Okay. Yes. Striking to me that basically you have association between cations, cation, cation association. Yes. So, what drives that beyond you know, the electrostatic repulsion? So, when the radicals are there, okay, is yeah. the radicals went out over the um, cationic charge. That that's what uh, prevented us, I think, just uh, for 20 years from even doing the experiment. I mean. I think anybody that looked at it and said uh, we could put paraquat inside the two positive charges inside a cyclovane with four positive charges, forget it. And you know, this young man came along from Lebanon and said, 
Well, mm -hmm. if I reduce the positive charges down to three and I put in uh, three radicals, uh, what's going to happen? And uh, what happened was amazing that uh, we get this very strong one-to-one -one complex, you know, six kilocalories per mole of binding, where um, if you actually get down into it, it is uh, a pairing up of uh, two of the radicals uh, with obviously their two cationic portions um, at any one time in that one-to-one uh, -one complex. And if you carry out uh, cyclic voltammetry experiments, um, you don't see three electrons going in plus another three electrons taking it through to a completely neutral species. You see two and then one and then one and then two. And so it tells you that uh, hidden within this tris radical tricationic complex, for example, is a quite stable. Um, uh, while there's still one of the, and this will be on the ring itself, dication, there's a quite stable interaction between a um, uh, <coughs> paraquat unit, which is a radical cation, and one of the bipyridinium units that is uh, a radical cation. And, uh, well, it's I, I, the one last thing I want to maybe say is uh, we've worked very closely with Bill Goddard at Caltech doing calculations and he's put a value of about, and of course this is just uh, hand-waving in many ways, a third of the value of an average covalent bond on the interaction between um, two bipyridinium radical cations. Okay. One other quick question. So your, your main pumps and whatnot, I, I, am, am I correct that you're, um, you're switching a macroscopic variable to get the pumping action? Is that correct? Like redox is changed. Uh, you have to drive the reaction by changing the pH, uh, you know, adding a yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, what came to mind were, were these remarkable sliding filament uh, experiments where you you mix uh, mm -hmm. uh, actin fibers with uh, yes, yes. myosin and, and throw in ATP and, and motion happens yeah, without yeah. switching well, any... You're quite you right. I mean, I have a slide that I haven't shown today in that very example of how actin and myosin operate in our muscles and the source of the uh, energy is coming, as you're pointing out, from a chemical fuel we call adenosine triphosphate. And uh, we all generate, even sitting here, 40 kilograms of that a day. Uh, to uh, keep all our muscular movements and so forth going in our many little bio biological motors. I mean, it's just absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah, do you see any way forward to, to um, taking your system and just adding something and it, it goes to work without switching a macroscopic problem? Well, I, <laughs> in a vague kind of way, I do. Uh, but, you know, I'm at this stage in my life where I'm just traveling as a traveling salesman for, uh, or ambassador would be a better way of putting it maybe, for science and chemistry. And so, uh, you know, I've got to hand this mantle on to uh, younger people to take it up and run with it. You know, uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for uh, the young community to embrace the mechanical bond. Uh, we've actually quite fortuitously produced a book, uh, a little bit of advertising here, The Nature of the Mechanical Bond. It came out in November of 2016 seventh thereof between halfway between learning about uh, going to Stockholm and going there. Um, <coughs> and uh, it's a six chapter book. Um, I would argue the first chapter is a pretty readable one. A layperson could probably, I hope, get their minds around it. There's then two on synthesis under synthetic, sorry, under kinetic and then thermodynamic control. And then there's one essentially on chemical topology, which uh, my co-laureate Jean-Pierre Sauvage uh, agrees, or perhaps is, uh, I agree with him. Uh, he's more of the, uh, as it were, uh, uh, person who, who loves chemical topology. He thinks th these, this area is going to get very big in chemistry in the next two, three decades. Uh, the one I would actually is in the fifth chapter is stereochemistry. The mechanical bond revolutionizes stereochemistry. It takes us out of the uh, almost uh, uh, <coughs> entirely uh, stereogenic center, chiral center, chiral, whatever you want to call it, domain into, in prelog language, axis of chirality, planes of chirality, and helical chirality. So it opens up, I think, a huge amount of uh, opportunities in chemistry itself. And then if you're looking further at applications, uh, 
with the um, <coughs> sliding rings on these polymer chains. There are already examples out of Japan of them being used commercially as scratch-resistant polymers. So. Yeah. Hello. Uh, the audience here, I think, maybe start again. Uh, um, Kritika. 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 Yeah. Kritika. I should always. Critical. Kritika. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's critical, so yeah, yeah. Kritika. You can remember it by, yeah. by that word. So, while building such molecules as Rotex Zanes, uh, are there any repulsions that are related, like the steric repulsions or electronic repulsions? Which one can dominate in? Uh, basically preventing you to make such molecules? Right, well, that's also a question that has a lot to, as I'm going to answer it. So the best slide ring polymers are going to end up being those where there's little crosstalk at a non-covalent bond between a polymer ring, sorry, a polymer chain and all the rings that are on it. They can slip along. We'll never wipe out van der Waals forces. They're going to be there, but they're going to be very, very small. Um, if we have uh, then sources of interactions, if they're hydrogen bonds or something like that, then we're going to dampen down the sliding force, and so that will change their material properties. That they might be better for uh, something else. But um, <coughs> perhaps one point I should make, uh, because I didn't uh, go through the long story of how the cathinines and rataxanes came into being is that we relied on uh, these donor acceptor interactions. At least we thought they were all important to begin with. Uh, subsequently, we found out that their importance was about 20% and the other 80% is CHO, hydrogen bonding. Uh, but that's maybe beside the point. The fact is that uh, by using the template, whatever it is, hydrogen bonding, donor acceptor, radical, provided these forces or structural entities remain in place, these weak forces live in the molecules afterwards. And that's what uh, I guess we should have anticipated, but uh, that, that was you know, how it got more and more exciting when uh, we realized that when we made our first donor acceptor catenin, it wasn't a question of the rings were just slipping willy-nilly with respect to each other. They were sitting very, very precisely on the average in a particular relative orientation with respect to each other. And we could use dynamic NMR spectroscopy to uh, unravel three different processes, a rocking one, right. Right. Um, a pirouetting one, and a circumrotation. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer your question, though? Yeah. No? Right. If not, you can harass me later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. be with you for three days, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody on this side? You know, give me a hard time, please. Yeah? I'm going to ask you a, a very easy question, I think. <laughs> it's not chemistry. Oh. W w how would you, uh, how, what was your experience at Birmingham? How long were you there? And oh. You said something about the fact that you had a hard time uh, getting funding in the beginning in Europe. So I was, I was well, it wasn't was so much funding. I had a hard time dealing with, uh, in Sheffield, a hierarchy. There were four professors there. I found out in 1970 they were at war with each other morning, noon, and night. It was like going into baronial England. and. Uh, you know, the young people were the people who uh, really suffered from that. Uh, I managed, ultimately, and one of the reasons I went to ICI was just to get out of that fight uh, that was going on all the time for three years. Uh, so that illustrates that out of something bad, something good appeared. Um, <coughs> so when I came back, I was very vocal, ultimately. I was the shy little Scottish boy who had uh, said very little during the first decade of uh, hitting back uh, um, against this nonsense. Uh, but when I came back, I decided that life was too short. Uh, I visited the vice chancellor at Sheffield, and I uh, said, well, you know, you must know that this is going on in your department. Are you going to do anything about it? And 
he, he just mealy-mouthed it all and nothing happened. So I wrote to the press in the UK, I wrote to the Times of London, the Manchester Garden, Guardian and the Telegraph and I became very quickly the most marked man and most unpopular, I think, um, you know, young upstart in the country. Uh, how dare I? Um, <coughs> so I wasn't a professor until I got the call, which is a very unusual thing to happen in the UK, from the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor at Birmingham, Sir Michael Thompson, a physicist, and uh, he had a chemistry department who had had gone from being great, it had housed uh, Sir Walter Norman Haworth, who had been a Nobel laureate back in 1937, but uh, had basically, from after World War II, gone downhill uh, with much of the same nonsense going on. And uh, he must have uh, maybe equated the fact that I had uh, been critical of what was happening and he might give me the chance to uh, you know, see what I could do. So um, he asked me to come and sort of salvage this chemistry department in 1990 uh, threw a lot of money at it and we also got a huge amount of money um, from the equivalent of the NSF, I think it was by that time the SERC, thanks to the fact that I um, managed to persuade them to send grant applications out to people like Don Cram and uh, Daryl Bush and uh, people in this country um, and they were incredibly supportive. Uh, so we had a wonderful um, seven years at Birmingham and that may well have it continued. The point was that in 92 my wife was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. She had a lumpectomy, 94 we had a, uh, she had a uh, mastectomy and things just got uh, more and more difficult. Uh, and so again, um, <coughs> I think I mentioned this tomorrow, um, you know, it was a tough time because it was a third of our married life and uh, fifth of her life fighting this insidious disease and uh, believe it or not, uh, disappointingly Birmingham did not have the oncologists or the means of treatment. This is England's second biggest city and so my wife was persuaded by 97 and I had had an offer from UCLA to go there from 92 uh, to succeed Don Cram. Uh, <coughs> uh, she, she was persuaded that we should move to uh, uh <coughs> Los Angeles uh, where the UCLA Breast Cancer Center raised their spirits by saying you've got a degenerative disease we have 50 different ways of uh, treating it so that was you know in a way um, after having a marvelous time at Birmingham it was uh, I think basically that uh, personal thing that uh, brought us across the pond uh, and I, I was very happy of course uh, as uh, the other individual in the team to come to the US. I'd always wanted to come here. I'd always been attracted by the marvelously horizontal nature of the academic system. And, you know, you don't know, some of you who have not been in other parts of the world, just how uh, upsetting it is to work in a hierarchical system where um, there is somebody at the top who very often is not very competent. Uh, wasting your time and uh, if that's happening on a daily basis and worse than that I mean I had people at the top who would bring me into their office and say if you continue like this we will destroy you I mean it's just a total lot of nonsense you know uh, you don't have this in America at least I don't find it and you know I often in the European context at least say when people ask uh, you know, what could we do to improve? I say, well, look, there's an academic system in the world that uh, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's the best there is. It's in the United States. Adopt it. And, uh, you know, you'll steal a march on anybody around you within a generation, but it's not going to happen. I can tell you that after uh, many years of uh, trying to push this one. The Europeans, one way or another, are still going to carry their baggage, whether um, it's good for them or not. Thank you. Yep. Um, I wonder, are there any um, interesting bulk material properties of these molecules that you're aware of? I, I, it, I think I saw you talk about, I think I've seen some nice uh, papers on um, uh, photomechanical actuation of molecules like that that is quite uh, amazing compared to traditional molecules, traditional materials. 
Yeah, I think a lot of material properties are going to uh, be unleashed, and uh, there's certainly a good one in Japan. Professor Ito and his group have um, come up with just polyethylene um, glycol with cyclodextrin rings on them, and this has been commercialized, and it's a nice scratch-resistant polymer because as you create the scratch, presumably the rings just uh, give you the space to uh, create the scratch, but as soon as... Uh, that is over, they then fill up the uh, scratch. So there's that example. There's also one in the lithium ion battery field where uh, putting these slide ring polymers into uh, the matrix of the cell ends up uh, stopping silicon nanoparticles from coalescing. And as they do, they apparently reduce the uh, efficiency of the lithium ion battery. So increasing the efficiency of uh, batteries is also another example to present. I think we're going to see a lot. The more and more that uh, uh, young people in particular come into the field of using the mechanical bond. Yeah. You know, I often say that um, in terms of bonding or in terms of chemistry, uh, new chemical compounds across the world are probably uh, tens of thousands a week. Uh, new chemical reactions, I don't know, 12 or 20 a year. A new chemical bond, which is as strong as the chemical bond that we know, covalent bond, uh, is once in a blue moon. And this is the mechanical bond. Because if you're going to break a simple catenate, the only way you're going to do it is, as in a normal molecule, break a covalent bond. So it's a very strong bond. And it gives you this marvelous movement uh, at a very small scale between its component parts. So there's plenty of room for creativity there.